Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now today I'd like to speak about the releases over the past month, and we've seen quite a few so far, and indeed I covered a few of the Swatch Group releases in a dedicated video for their particular show, which you can see on the channel. However, today I'd like to speak more generally, with several very interesting releases, one affordable piece from Timex, which really is a great fun piece, all the way through to an incredible Moritz Grossman with a, a remarkable movement, as well as an Omega which, whilst priced at a high level, I think represents exceptional value on the market. However, before I begin the video, I would of course like to encourage you to like, share and subscribe if you enjoy this video and find the content useful. Also, do follow me on Instagram at the address which is now on the screen to be able to access more content such as watch sales from my personal collection, in addition to any other content which I might have there, which I wouldn't post on the channel, such as if I was going to an event or seeing something which, uh, which simply didn't fit with the channel. So to be able to access all of this extra content, do follow me on Instagram at the address on the screen. Now the first watch to speak about is a new Quartz Timex, which is a remake of a watch from 1979 from the brand. And this watch is called the Q Timex, and it's a stainless steel dive-inspired timepiece with a very 70s style to it. The case is 38mm in diameter by 43.4 in length by 12.4 in thickness. So it's by no means a large watch, and I think takes advantage of its quartz movement very, very effectively while still retaining a heavily domed acrylic crystal to give a vintage feel to the watch. But the idea of this watch is not to be a vintage 1960s inspired dive watch, it's to be a rather cool 1970s and 80s watch, which really remakes and replicates that period's charm if you look at the watches of the time. And so naturally this watch is quartz, because that was very much the, uh, the movement of the day. And inside this watch one finds a Seiko S2 Epson PC33, which is a relatively inexpensive quartz movement, which does have some aspects which aren't exactly up to very high standards, such as the lack of a quick set day for the day date function, although it does still feature quick, a quick set date, so you do still have some control over this, but it's a very rudimentary quartz movement, but should keep time very accurately. But whilst it would be very easy to be very critical of this watch as a result of the choice of movement, I think the rest of the watch is a really wonderful display of what can be achieved when a brand produces an almost perfect remake of a vintage watch because this piece really does replicate the feel of a 1970s and 80s timepiece. For example, the bezel features a blackened PVD finish underneath its edge, which does replicate the way they looked in the period. Similarly, one doesn't have a, a very modern style of case. Instead, the edges are slightly sharper. One sees a very fine brushing across the case to give this barrel shape, albeit with sharp edges, a slightly more charming form and something which really does look like it comes straight out of the pages of history. There are some bevels along the sides of the case with polished elements as well, and the bracelet is a fantastic remake of those folded link bracelets of the period, because really this bracelet uh, remakes the, the fine link nature, which one simply doesn't see on modern bracelets uh, quite so much as one saw in the period, with these very narrow links which are folded, but gave extreme comfort as a result of the links being able to move extremely smoothly. Looking underneath the very vintage style of heavily domed acrylic crystal on the front of the watch, Again, I think a good choice, because if it's knocked it won't be damaged too severely, and can be polished smooth again if it becomes scratched. Underneath this one finds a dark blue dial with a vintage Timex logo with quartz emblazoned across it, and with a Q logo at 12 as well. And I rather like the fact that they've worn this, uh, this, this quartz nature of the watch with pride, because there's no need to hide something like this when the watch is actually trying to celebrate that period in time, when this sort of movement was becoming very popular. And aside from that, the dial is luminous with this, this dive watch arrangement with these luminous indices which are painted onto the dial, as well as luminous hands. Although the red second hand isn't luminous, I think this isn't too big a concern on a watch of this type. Then of course one has the day-date function, as well as a rotating bezel which is bi-directionally rotating and is knurled around its edge with this GMT functionality to be able to be used either to time minutes, hours, or to be used for a separate time zone if you so wish. And really the only aspect of this watch which I feel falls short is the water resistance. Because this piece only has a 50 meter water resistance despite being marketed with images of boats and, um, and aquatic environments, which I think is a missed opportunity, because this really would make a fantastic multi-purpose piece if it was released with a screw down crown and either 100 or 200 meter water resistance. However, as a whole package, I think for a price of 179 US dollars or 159 pounds, I think it's a great choice. The second piece I'd like to speak about relates to a rather important anniversary for watchmaking, because I feel that this year, as a result of the 50th anniversary of the Omega Speedmaster's moon landing, there has been a great deal of, uh, of publicity for that, but in all of this excitement, I think one watch has been forgotten, 
and this is the Tag Heuer, or rather Heuer, Monaco, which was released in 1969 with the very famous Calibre 11, which was one of the very first of the, uh, the, the chronograph movements released with automatic winding that year. And it was a modular movement, released uh, using a Buren micro-rotor movement with a Dubois de Près chronograph module over the top, thus showing a, a different solution to the fully integrated Zenith El Primero, or indeed some Seiko movements from the period. However, the, the anniversary still stands as an important moment, and so Hoyer have released a new piece, one of five in fact this year, to commemorate each of the five decades this watch has existed. And this first one doesn't take inspiration directly from the Monaco itself, but rather from the aesthetic of the 60s and the 70s. Because this watch is a 39mm stainless steel piece with a very recognisable case with those uh, bevelled edges and brushed elements, with that vertical brushing as well, to give some elements which just give a, a wonderful shine in the light and capture the period beautifully. Naturally, it is also water resistant to 100 metres, making it a great sports watch all round. But the coloration of this watch is very different to what we've seen before. The dial itself isn't blue, as you might have expected for a watch from this, uh, this series. Instead, it's green to commemorate the coloration of the period, and so one has this Côte de Genève striping in green, which is this sort of forest green with a bit of yellow to it, which then has some accents on the dial, with red-brown accents as well as yellow ones on both the hands and the dial itself. Of course, the dial also features these anthracite subdials, which retain their square shape, and the date is placed at 6 o'clock as standard. And whilst this watch is perhaps not the ideal first Monaco for someone who wants to get into the style of this watch, where of course the blue version would be the obvious choice, with of course the crown on the opposite side of the case, as is the case on this commemoration version, I think this version offers something very different, as a limited edition of only 169 pieces, although I would assume that all four other watches being released this year will also be that same limited run. So as a whole range, they probably won't be too limited, but still a, uh, a fantastically refreshing number by comparison to the enormous limited editions that Omega makes. And the movement inside this watch is something which is, is, comes as no surprise, because it's the modern calibre 11 from, uh, from Tag Heuer. And so it's not the original movement with the Buren micro-rotor movement with a chronograph module over the top. Instead, we see a movement which is designed to resemble that movement, so it uses the Salita SW300, which is uh, based on the architecture of the ETA289 series of movements, with a Dubois de Prime module over the top. And this means the watch has a 40-hour power reserve and a staggering 59 joules as a result of the, the module being placed on top. This also means that you get automatic winding, it runs at 4 hertz, which is 8 ticks per second, and you also get those opposite side pushes with the crown placed on the left-hand side, which I think is a highly underrated arrangement because it moves the crown out of the way and really is ideal for a chronograph. And so the price for these watches, which I think are a, a really wonderful take on the Monaco, albeit an acquired taste, is 6550 US dollars being produced in 169 pieces. The watch which I feel is perhaps the highlight of this video, and perhaps even the highlight of the month, is the new Omega Seamaster Aquaterra World Timer. And this is a watch which I was asked why I didn't include, in fact, in my Swatch releases this month. And the reason for that was because I really wanted to show this on a level playing field with other watches being released by, by equivalent brands. And so I feel that this really is the correct video to show it. Because this piece represents a new world in value. And World Timer watches are con conventionally seen as being very expensive complications. And certainly this watch is by no means inexpensive, and I really do emphasise that. But by comparison to what else there is on the market, I think this is a spectacular release for Omega, and a really remarkable one in steel, for something which costs an equivalent price to a two-tone Datejust. So I think this is really one to watch. Because this piece is a 43mm watch which shares the semi-dive watch form of the Aquaterra, which in many ways is the closest to the original concept of the Omega Seamaster, as a watch which you could use in pretty much any setting, but still had elegance and, and a fantastic design. And whilst 43mm may seem large, I think it fits very well with the concept of the, the watch as a whole, and also allows you to have a slightly more advanced movement, which I'll get to in a moment. And this watch now comes in two unlimited versions, in steel or in 18 karat Sedna Gold, that's their proprietary style of rose gold. And the prices reflect this, with the price for the steel version ranging from 8,200 Swiss francs to 8,400, and the gold version being more expensive at 21,000 to 33,500. Through the use of a screw-down crown, this watch is able to achieve 150 metres of water resistance, enough realistically to even dive with this watch, which is quite remarkable when you think of a world timer being used for diving. But aside from that, you're able to get similar options on both watches, with a stainless steel bracelet and a rubber strap being available, and then there is also an option of alligator leather too. 
and these pieces share the dial design, except the steel version gets a blue dial, which is my personal favourite, whilst the gold version gets a creamy silver. And both share the same style, with a teak decking style, which uh, resembles the decking on a boat, which I think is a nice touch, running down the dial, although curving out of the way to allow space for that circular world time function in the centre. And then around the very edge of the dial, one sees the, the various locations for which you can adjust this watch to match with that world time function, including the, the city of Bien, which I think is a nice touch, considering that's the hometown of Omega, and they could have put any other city for GMT plus one, but instead chose that. The hands on this watch are beautifully faceted, with a number of elements which are luminous to be able to read this watch at night, and it's extremely symmetrical thanks to the use of having the Omega logo at the top, and the date placed at 6 o'clock, which is becoming a recurring theme with modern Omega sports watches. But the real piece de résistance is the centre of the dial, with a hesalite ring which rotates around the edge of that, so that world timer function, which allows you to have that bicolored day and night indication with the 24 hours, and then in the centre one has a titanium sort of medallion, if you will, with which, uh, upon which lasers have been used to give colour and also texture to this, to this display of the world, which is a, a very different way of approaching this, and I think a nice alternative to the enamel, for example, seen on a traditional world timer watch. Turning this watch over, you're able to see a rather wonderful movement through the exhibition case back. And these are movements from the 8900 range from Omega. And these movements uh, do not really have a size which is compatible with smaller Omega models, hence the 43mm size of the case. Because the 8900 series has the additional uh, quirk, in addition of course to being master coaxial chronometers, thus allowing the watch to be antimagnetic to 15,000 Gauss, and have a number of tests conducted through the use of complete antimagnetism, the use of non-metallic parts, it's also able to have two spring barrels. And the beauty of this is that it gives a 60-hour power reserve, but also allows the watch to have a very even delivery of torque through the movement, thus giving better timekeeping. These watches run at the rather peculiar beat rate of 7 beats per second at 25,200 vibrations per hour, and of course use the coaxial escapement. And it's been found that this particular beat rate is most suitable for it, as a result of uh, minimising wear through a slightly lower beat rate, but also still keeping a higher beat to be able to keep accuracy. And so it's a nice mix of, of both, uh, both elements. And these movements are the 8938 for the steel and the 8939 for the gold, and the only difference is the gold version has a gold rotor and a gold balance bridge, but aside from that, both are identical. And they also both feature the world timer, of course, the date function, and of course are all automatic winding, which is extremely useful for really the ideal traveller's watch, which I see in this timepiece. And naturally, the movements are beautifully finished with that very distinctive Omega style, and then one has a case which is quintessentially Seamaster, with a protruding crown on this watch, as opposed to the guarded crown on the last generation of Aquaterra. And whilst I prefer the guarded crown on the older versions, on the, the standard models of the Aquaterra, I think this unguarded crown works perfectly with a slightly more delicate and more refined piece that this piece is. And so I think for the price, this is a remarkable piece, and offers a, a really extremely important and, and very impressive package to the industry. Whilst that Omega is undoubtedly a fantastic value option, and a remarkable piece for the price in terms of offering functionality and a really brilliant movement, it's Morris Grossman which has really caught my imagination. Because this is a brand which produces incredible movements, and the movements really are produced to a phenomenal standard. The finishing, the design, the engineering is, is superb here. And unfortunately they're a brand which isn't discussed, I think, enough, which, which I think is a shame. But today I'd like to speak about a piece which is, is quite remarkable, which is the Hematic, and this is a watch which presents a very different form of automatic winding. Now to understand this watch fully, one has to look at the origins of automatic winding. Because in 1780, Breguet released a, a watch which he called the Perpetuel, which used a, uh, a piece which rotated as more of a pendulum than a rotor as an automatic winding function and so through the movement of the watch, this would wind up the spring. And Moritz Grossman have recreated this form in their new piece. And this piece was initially shown in late 2018 with a skeletonized dial, but has actually now hit the market with a fully closed dial, which I think is more aesthetically pleasing, and in a refined format. Before speaking about the rather remarkable movement though, one has to talk about the general design of this watch, which I feel is, is beautiful in terms of being very simple and very delicate in its aesthetics because this piece has a 41mm diameter by 11.35mm thick. And whilst this is on the large side for a three-hand dress watch, considering the movement and also considering the way in which it's built, I think this is perfectly reasonable. 
and also allows you to enjoy the dial, which has been inspired by previous pocket watches from the brand, which I think is, is a lovely inspiration, especially considering the inspiration for the movement too. And the design of the dial is very simple with this, this uh, white surface, in addition to a railroad style of track around the very edge of the dial, executed in a very delicate way, in addition to Roman numerals, and of course on these versions there's no longer the skeletonized component at the bottom of the dial, which most people have viewed as a positive factor, and I must say I agree, because it just allows the dial to appear that little bit more elegant. There are of course small seconds too, and the hands are this distinctive style, and are firmly treated to have this, this purpley brown colour, rather than the conventional blue, which I think looks absolutely wonderful. But moving behind the silvery white dial of this watch and the 380M water resistant case with an exhibition case back, one sees a really beautiful movement and a fascinating one too. And this is the Calibre 106. Now it's a movement which is, is in-house of course from Moritz Grossman and is of course made in Germany. And the finishing is superb. Um, there's a uh, fantastic striping across the main bridge that one sees, or the main plate you could say, with these beautiful gold chetons which are screwed into place with blued screws, of course, with this distinctive coloration. And then one sees graining across that uh, that hammer, which one sees for the automatic winding, and beveling throughout, which is superbly done. And the finishing on Moritz Grossman watches is, is really beautiful. Every time I've been able to see one, whether it's at Baselworld or at uh, an individual showings, um, which I've happened to uh, see by chance, they've been thoroughly beautiful watches, and um, the watchmaking here really is phenomenal. But sitting on top of this movement, and uh, rather obviously, is this hammer, and this takes the form of the automatic winding rotor you would normally expect to see in an automatic watch. And it moves uh, moves across the movement with a, a pivot placed on the one side. And despite the fact that it only moves a few degrees, it's able to wind the movement very efficiently, thanks to the weighting of a solid gold weight on the one end, in addition to the fact that because the pivot has been placed far in, on one side of the movement, it's actually able to be a significant size, and thus its movement is able to wind the spring efficiently. And in terms of, uh, of of engineering here, one also sees small springs mounted internally within the, sh the the form of the hammer, within the the surface area of the hammer, you could say, which prevent it from over over winding, so moving too far in terms of um, of swinging too far across the movement and having any impact uh, with the sides of the case or or any other sort of problem. And so it's a really thoroughly well designed concept, and of course does take inspiration, you could say, from those 1780s watches by Breguet. And the beauty of this movement is something which is, is difficult to explain because it doesn't look much like other mechanical movements that one sees in a wristwatch. And this is because thanks to that large assembly on the top and the fact that one has a, a sort of a bridge arrangement which is more similar to my eye to something you would see in a pocket watch, albeit without the verge escapement you would see from a pocket watch of the period. But it really is a thoroughly beautiful thing and, uh, and a marvellous thing to behold in terms of being something completely different to other high horology in this sort of price range but something really for the connoisseur. And the price of this watch is €37,600, and is a unique and beautiful timepiece. The final piece which I'd like to speak about is a really remarkable piece from Zenith, which resurrects another part of classic high horology. Because this piece resurrects the fusée as a chain used within the movement between the, the spring barrel and the gear train. And this is the Zenith El Primero fusée tourbillon, so it also includes a tourbillon. And so it does bring together a number of these, these complications designed in the past with pocket watches to increase accuracy. And uh, before I speak about the, the, the mechanism within this watch, I'd like to speak about the watch in general. And it has the 44mm case from the Defy El Primero, which is, is a line of watches from Zenith which I think is absolutely superb. They've released a number of truly remarkable pieces under this line, and, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that they're continuing. And this watch is being produced in 10 pieces in platinum, or 50 pieces in carbon, both with 100 meter water resistance, which I think is suitable for these semi-sports watches, which these watches uh, represent in the Zenith range, and the most modern of sides to the brand, which is ironic when it's added to the concept of having a fusée chain. Of course, invariably the first thing one sees looking at the front of this watch is the dial, or, or lack thereof, because it has this open-worked dial, which resembles a, a sports car wheel or something of that nature, giving a very automotive feel to this watch, which I think fits the, the Defy sort of range as a, a concept, as a very modern form. And so the dial d displays, of course, the time with the, the three hands, of course the tourbillon serving as the, the seconds, with the hours and the minutes in the centre, and one also has the hand which is used for, uh, for the power reserve indicator, which is 50 hours on this particular timepiece, placed on the one side of the dial, which is a useful feature when considering the fact that this watch is manually wound. But this brings me neatly to the movement, 
which is the El Primero 4805SK. And I find the choice of the name El Primero is, is a peculiar one, because of course this watch doesn't feature a chronograph or automatic winding, both of which were, were, uh, were key aspects to the El Primero as a movement, so I must admit I do find the fact that this watch falls under that category a tad confusing. But if one ignores that, one finds a watch which does still run at 5 hertz, giving you 36,000 vibrations per hour, or 10 ticks per second, with a 50 hour power reserve. And so it does of course have manual winding, and a 60 second tourbillon at 6, which allows you to use that as the seconds of course. And this offsets the, the balance wheel as well to the one side, rather than having the, the balance wheel in the centre of the tourbillon as is conventionally seen. But finished in the same blue as the, the tourbillon cage, one also sees a fusée chain. And this is what most excites me about this watch, because fusée chains are usually seen on pocket watches, and, uh, and, and are incredibly difficult to make. For example, the fusée chain on this watch takes 575 parts on its own, um, aside from the rest of the movement, which is, which is incredible. And the purpose of the fusée chain really is to change the gearing size between the, the gear train of the watch and the spring. Because as a spring unwinds, the amount of torque released by it is, uh, is not constant, um, as a result of, uh, of it changing throughout the, the, uh, the movement from being fully, fully wound to, to fully discharged. And the purpose of the fusée chain is that um, through the, the unwinding of this chain, and its movement from, from being wrapped around the, the spring barrel to uh, wrapped around the, the opposite cog, one sees the idea of uh, changing the size of these in order to account for the change in torque, which I think is a very, very clever concept, and, uh, and something which one simply doesn't see on wristwatches. And so I find the idea of combining this with a tourbillon to, to better suit this watch in terms of creating higher accuracy, but also higher consistency within the timekeeping, is quite superb. And with the exotic materials being used, whether it's platinum or carbon for the case, the price is undoubtedly expensive for these watches, although considering the, the innovation going into them, it's unsurprising. And so the price for the 50-piece limited edition in carbon is 85,900 Swiss francs, whilst the platinum version being limited to only 10 pieces is 109,900 francs. But with that uh, rather remarkable zenith, I'll conclude the video here. But do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of the watches uh, released this month, whether it's from the Swatch releases earlier in the month, or these other releases which I think are equally meritorious, in terms of being, uh, being beautifully made and, and very clever too. And if you enjoyed this video then do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.